Aloha, ahi kako apau. Aloha. It's great to see you guys again. Hey, <laughs> how many of you have seen our traditions and technology workshop before? All right, awesome. Of course, a big shout out, big mahalo to Jeff, the whole Habilitat Ohana, Brother Derek, Darren, the whole gang, the cooks, all of you guys' hard work. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate having the opportunity to come and share with you guys. And we also are very proud of you. We're very proud of what you guys are doing. It's awesome. So give yourselves a round of applause. We're going to have a great evening tonight. How many of you know about the ukulele? <laughs> the magic question. Keep your hands down. No, no. <laughs> Actually, the ukulele is a little mini guitar. It's kind of like this. But we're going to get some really cool insight to what the ukulele is and really what makes an ukulele. So for tonight, and this is what I've done in the past, I'm going to ask you guys, if you wouldn't mind, just closing your eyes, taking a nice deep breath, exhale, take another nice, beautiful deep breath, and exhale, and a third beautiful oxygenated breath, inhale, exhale. And keep your eyes closed, because we're actually going to take a little ride. We're going to take a ride to Kanileo Ukulele, and it's where we're going to see how an ukulele is made. We're also going to learn a little bit on the history of the ukulele and what makes an ukulele as special as it may be. So why don't you go ahead and open up your eyes. Aloha everyone. Aloha. Aloha ahi ahi kako apau. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome to Kanileo Ukulele. And as we go on our journey tonight, please, I'm going to ask if you could just keep your questions. There will be a moment here at the end where we can have a question and answer segment. And I'll be able to ha I'll happily be able to help you answer some of the questions that you may have and give you some insight towards the ukulele. So the, the title of tonight's presentation is called The Making of a Joyful Sound. And I'll give you some insight on how we even got to that name. You'll notice there, kanilea ukulele. Kanilea, in Hawaiian, translated to English, means joyful sound. So that's where we're going to learn about the joyful sound of an ukulele. Also a little bit about Islander. First we're going to learn about the history of the ukulele. And the little picture there, that's actually a picture of my grandmother playing her ukulele. And we circa that picture at being about 1914 to 1916. She was about oh, 12 to 14 years old. <clears throat> now the ukulele was actually introduced by the Portuguese. The Portuguese, when they came here, they brought parts of their culture. And yes, they brought sweet bread, and they brought Portuguese bean soup, but they also brought the ukulele, or what was known in Portugal as the breguinha, or the mechete de braga. Basically, that translates to small guitar from braga. So as they brought these parts of their culture and introduced it to the Hawaiians, of course, the Hawaiians totally embraced the instrument. One of the most influential individuals to embrace the ukulele was King David Kalakaua. Now, Kalakaua embraced the arts. He embraced hula. He embraced dance. He also embraced mele, or music. And in that, he embraced the ukulele. So when he took a liking to the ukulele, of course, the popularity of the ukulele grew. Now, how many of you know how the ukulele got its name? Kind of interesting, huh? One story is, these Portuguese immigrants were so happy to be in their new homeland that they jumped up and down, strumming their breguenha, looking like jumping fleas. That's what ukulele translates to. Ukulele is basically jumping flea or jumping head lice. The other story is, an advanced player's fingers move so quickly across the fingerboard, they resemble jumping fleas or ukulele. Now, of course, being half Portuguese, I like the second story a lot better, which is the advanced player's fingers. Anyway, the name of the instrument stuck, and the Hawaiians started basically calling these baby guitars ukulele. <clears throat> now, as Kalakaua made it popular, 
these local craftsmen took the instrument to San Francisco. It was at a Pan Pacific Expo where the ukulele was first introduced to the United States. And the popularity of the ukulele literally took off across the United States. And it made its way all the way to the East Coast where it played a big effect in the vaudeville Tin Pan Alley music era. So it's not uncommon to go to New York and hear this kind of ragtime style of music being played on the ukulele because it's what they so closely associated the instrument with, that music genre, that Tin Pan Alley kind of music, which of course is totally different than what we as Hawaiian ukulele players associated the ukulele with. <clears throat> now, through the 1920s and into the 60s, the ukulele was extremely popular. Pretty much, it was mainstream. It was called the people's instrument. And it's because it's so easy to learn, it's easy to play, you can basically play any kind of music you want on the instrument. And so the popularity of the instrument was just huge. <clears throat> now, there was a moment there where the ukulele took a pretty hard hit. And it wasn't only the ukulele. It was pretty much all of the acoustic instruments. The banjo, the acoustic guitar, the mandolin. They all took a hard hit. And that was with the invention of the electric guitar. Rock and roll was king. So all of these kind of acoustic instruments fell out of the limelight with rock and roll being so popular. Now, in Hawaii, the ukulele was still popular because there was a big Hawaiian music renaissance that was taking place in the late 60s into the 70s with the groups like uh, Sons of Hawaii, the Sunday Manoa, uh, Peter Moon Band, who then was still showcasing the ukulele and showing that the ukulele is actually a very versatile instrument. Now, you got to understand, there was a certain... Uh, stigma that came with ukuleles. At the time, we had people like Tiny Tim, who was tiptoeing through the tulips. I don't know if you guys ever seen that before, but it's very, very weird. It made the ukulele not in a good light. It made it kind of more like a quirky instrument, not really a legitimate musical instrument. <clears throat> now, we're going to just kind of step into today where a little bit of history about us as Kanileo ukulele. I started building ukulele in, the in 1993. Of course, I got introduced to the ukulele and how to play the ukulele much earlier. Pretty similar to many others who grow up here. In the fourth grade, you learn the ukulele. You learn D7, G7, C, and some of the basic chords. And you learn with those basic chords, you can play like 5,000 Hawaiian songs. But fortunately, my fourth grade music teacher was my mom's twin sister. So she literally grabbed me by the ear, sat me in front of her class, and said, hey, you're going to learn ukulele. And it changed my life. It made me fall in love with the ukulele. Now, she was obviously planting a seed or a love for this musical instrument. I didn't know what she was doing at the time. All I knew is she said, you're going to learn. <clears throat> anyway, as I started playing ukulele, I eventually got very inquisitive on how an ukulele was made which led to me learning how to build an ukulele. I uh, learned from a gentleman by the name of Peter Bermudez. He literally lives right by Winard Mall, uh, right by your guy's warehouse on Kauhipa. And fortunately, he shared the craft with me. And I was able to then build my own ukulele, which then, of course, was the beginning of Kanileo ukulele. We started, both my wife Kristen and I, she's back there probably... Facebooking or something, <laughs> uh, started Kanileo Ukulele in 1998. As Kanileo Ukulele, we've evolved. So this is a little snapshot of our pic of our the front of our shop. Uh, we moved to our current location in 2005. So we've been there just about 10 years. February made 10 years, and it's a 7,000 square foot factory on where we build our ukulele. It's a state-of-the-art facility. We employ a lot of technology in how we build our instruments. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about our philosophy. Now, we have one foot that's rooted in tradition. The ukulele is so synonymous to Hawaii, next to surfing, hula, uh, the pineapple, for whatever reason. Of course, there's the ukulele. In the same respect, we have one foot that's rooted in technology and what we do as a modern-day builder. Now, to say we weren't building a great ukulele, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. That's false. We were building the best ukulele we could with the knowledge that we had of the time. Well, here we are as a modern day builder. So we employ a lot of technology, 
similarly to how technology pretty much surrounds us today with CNC technology or computer numerically controlled technology. We'll also see UV technology is where we cure the finish on our instrument through a UV or sunlight form of curing. We'll also get a chance to see a laser, which is where we cut out the work pieces, it etches lines. It's really employing technology in a whole new way and giving, giving us the accuracy and tolerances that we want as a modern day builder. So of course, we specialize in standard to professional grade ukulele. <clears throat> the ukulele journey really starts with the wood. We use koa wood. Koa is an indigenous hardwood. And although koa is an acacia, and there are acacia woods found all over the world, acacia koa is indigenous to Hawaii. And what makes acacia koa different than its cousins found all over the world is koa has a tendency to grow at a very high elevation. Because it grows at a high elevation, it leads to a slower growth rate, which then gives the wood greater lateral strength, yet it still has elasticity or the ability to vibrate. And that's why koa has become so popular, not only for the ukulele, but even in the guitar world. Pretty much every guitar maker has a koa model or a koa line where he integrates koa into many different grades of instrument. And it's because of its beauty and of course of its tone. That's why it's become so popular. Now we use air dried, well seasoned koa. And air drying is a very important step in the final tone of the ukulele. Every single step that we do in the building of the instrument is about sound. That's what we're looking at. Of course, looks and with the inlays and kind of blinging out the instrument, we're able to do that. But the reality is sound. Because if you don't have a good sounding ukulele, then it's just a piece of wood, really. Sound is everything. So we use air dried koa wood. <clears throat> we'll slice the koa wood to about 3 sixteenths of an inch or 187 thousandths of an inch. It's kind of a rough cut and that's an initial cut because we're going to start something which is called the book matching process. Now book matching I'll explain to you. If you see one of these kind of beams of koa wood, that's what this is right here. That's how we receive our koa, is in a beam of koa. We'll actually slice the first piece off of the block and then the second piece off of the block and those two become a married pair and they reveal this symmetrical, or what is called book-matched grain. We'll get the front of the ukulele, the back of the ukulele, and the sides of the ukulele, all in order. Because what that does is, on the completed instrument, it looks like we carved the ukulele out of one chunk of koa wood. Where in reality, we're creating that effect through the book-matching process. So it's a pretty important step. So I brought what we call a set of koa wood. This is a front, a back, a set of sides, and also the head plate, which is going to go up on by the tuning keys a little later in the process. I'm going to pass this around so you guys can take a look. This is actually koa that's going to become an ukulele. Now, after we do the book matching and we create the set, then we're going to do what is called edge gluing, where we actually glue a portion of the wood together as we're creating that symmetrical or book matched grain. And then we're going to final sand the wood to 80 thousandths of an inch. So in our shop, we're very, very accurate. The machinery is extremely accurate. So when we're talking in thousandths of an inch, that's how we talk in the shop. It's that accurate. So those are 80 thousandths of an inch. Now we'll of course keep it in order in order to create our book matching set. And that's a complete set right there. One of the first stops for the wood is it's going to go into a laser. And we have a CO2 laser cutter. It does several things. One, it will cut out the workpiece. So it will cut it out to the shape of the instrument. Also establish where the sound hole is going to be. But it will also give us these lines on the inside of the instrument. These are the bracings. The bracing has already been glued on. But when you take a look at this piece as I pass it around, you'll see that there's little etch lines. It looks like little very fine pencil lines. Those are actually created in the laser. They're mathematically placed in reference to the lower bout, the waist, and the upper bout, and then of course the center line, which is a very important reference for us as we build the instrument. Now the ukulele and the building of an ukulele is not like the building of a house, where you build one wall and 90 degrees to that wall, you build another wall, that's pretty much how you would build a house. For the ukulele, 
everything is tapered or round. There's nothing really square to reference. So our constant or our reference is the center line. It's very similar to how we build a boat. Everything is referenced off of that center line. That's our constant. So you'll see the center line even on this workpiece. You'll see it on the wood that's going around. There's actually little keyways that we create when we glue those pieces that shows us where the center line is. <clears throat> now as the laser cuts out the coal, it's going to cut out the front, the back, the sides, and of course the head plate. The laser is accurate to one thousandth of an inch. So to bring that into perspective, a piece of hair is six thousandths of an inch. A piece of paper is seven thousandths of an inch. The laser is accurate to one thousandth of an inch. It's, it's crazy accurate. And that's what we're looking for as a musical instrument builder, that type of accuracy, because we're looking for ultimately the final sound of the instrument. Also it etches the lines, and you can see it actually in action here. That's where it's cutting, right at that kind of pinpoint there. It's already cut out other portions of the body as it's going through the laser. Now, once we cut out the workpiece, we're going to stop at our rosette station. Now, the rosette is a decorative inlay. We'll see it here on this workpiece. As we go ahead and pass it around, you guys will be able to see it. There are different rosettes that we offer. This is New Zealand abalone. It's called Paua, and it's an inlay. We actually cut a channel into the curly core and inlay the abalone or inlay the raw shell into the soundboard. So the soundboard is 80 thousandths of an inch. The shell is actually 50 thousandths of an inch. So if we could see on the inside of the workpiece on this particular instrument, you wouldn't see the shell. It's a delicate inlay that's going on on the front of the instrument. So we have a rosette station where we do the different inlays. Abalone, wood inlays, we use different alternative um, black, white, black strips. That's what they're called in the industry. We also use sand. We get sand from Kailua Beach, which is the really, really fine powdery sand, and we use that as an inlay on the instrument. <clears throat> Next we're going to do is our bracing, and that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier here, and I'm going to pass this around so you guys can see it. The bracing system that we, that we use is very unique. We call it true bracing, total resonating ukulele bracing. And it's unique for our instrument. There isn't any other ukulele builder who does bracing like us. <clears throat> for the material, we actually use spruce. So you'll notice that the wood on the inside of the instrument is a lighter color wood. It's spruce that we bring from Alaska. And spruce, or Sitka spruce, is preferred because it actually has a very high strength to weight ratio. So it's very light, yet it's very strong. So that's how we're able to brace the instrument. On our bracing system, we integrate some science. It's called an X, Y, and Z axis. So for many years, ukulele builders and guitar builders alike were under the impression that the soundboard on an instrument wants to move on two axis. It wants to move on X, and it wants to move on Y, or forward, back, left, and right. Well, it was discovered that the soundboard does want to move on X. It wants to move on Y, but it also wants to move on Z, which is up and down. So you'll notice on our bracing, there's actually a relief of 40 thousandth of an inch on every brace to allow the soundboard to gain what is called Z access. So you'll see that as I pass the workpiece around. Now, of course, the spruce is shaped and um, carved to say, or scalloped is the term, where we do the final shaping of the spruce. And that's all has to do with the sound of the instrument. Now, in our industry, there are two philosophies. One is, well, just take out the braces. Don't put any bracing, and you'll get a better sounding ukulele. But what happens is you sacrifice the strength that is needed to handle the string tension over the life of the instrument. The alternative, of course, is to brace your ukulele, but brace it strategically so you can still provide strength, yet allow for sound. That's what's most important. <clears throat> Next, we're going to go to the side bending station. Now the side bending station is where we're going to bend the, the sides which actually start off flat. As you see the coal wood set that's going around, you'll see pieces that are kind of long. Those are going to become the sides of the instrument. In order for us to bend the sides, we have to introduce heat. So you'll see the side bender right here. And you'll see this kind of orange rubberized blanket. That's actually a heating blanket. 
and it heats up to about 300 degrees in a little less than a minute. We're going to steam bend the core in order for it to get to the shape of the instrument to create this kind of figure eight shape. We have to bend the wood. So as the wood gets bent, then we're going to go ahead and add the blocking. And the blocking is going to go on the inside of the instrument. It's going to help to strengthen where the neck and body will be joined later on. Also, it's going to help to strengthen our book match portion, which is here on what is called the tail block. <clears throat> and I'm going to pass these around so everybody can see. And then on the inside, also, you'll see these little pieces that are running along the edge of the instrument. That's called kerf lining. And the kerf lining is there to do two things. One, it adds a wider gluing surface. So when we go to glue the front and the back of the instrument together, we get better adhesion between the front and the back. But it also adds a sense of rigidity to the sides. So it helps the sides to hold their shape as they're going through the building of the instrument. So I'm going to pass these sets this way so you guys can see here. And I'll pass this this way because I have two of the examples. You guys can take a look at the sides there. <clears throat> so the kerf lining, of course, adds strength. I'm going to step back a little. Next, we're going to assemble the instrument. That's where we're going to put the front, the back, and the sides of the instrument together. And so this picture is depicting an instrument that's actually being assembled. We're putting together the front, back, and sides. They're kind of being sandwiched together as we assemble the instrument. On the back of our ukulele, as I pass around the assembled body, you'll see it actually has a radius. We create that radius. It's both going this way and this way. It's a compounding radius. And that's, a, once again, for the sound of the instrument. It helps to actually channel the vibration that's taking place off of the soundboard. And it adds strength to the back also. <clears throat> of course, we're creating the body of the instrument. This is where the majority of the sound of the instrument is going to be created in the body. So I'm going to pass this around too. I'm going to go this side so you guys can see. Here you go. Now we're getting ready to actually shape the neck on the ukulele. The neck that we use or the material that we use for our neck is genuine mahogany. Now genuine mahogany is not found here in Hawaii. We actually bring it from South America. It's genuine mahogany. It was going to become a guitar neck at a guitar uh, factory, but it became invalid because it may have had a knot, a bark inclusion, a crack. We're able to purchase that neck material, palletize it, send it here to Honolulu to become part of our ukuleles. Now the neck, of course, and genuine mahogany, the reason why we use that material is because genuine mahogany has a tendency to grow very, very straight. Because it grows very straight, it has great lateral strength. So it can take the string tension which is happening off of the body and as it cantilevers off of the body it has enough strength to handle the string tension so that the ukulele doesn't break or fall apart. Right now it's mounted on the CNC machine so the neck is a one-piece neck and I'm gonna pass these around so you guys can see there's a neck that's rough or what's considered rough in our shop and if you look closely to it you'll see the tool paths and then there's also a neck that has been final sanded, so you can see what happens after it comes off the CNC machine. There you go. So it's a one-piece mahogany neck. It gets an initial cut off of the machine on a bandsaw, and then it gets mounted onto the CNC machine, and the CNC machine actually cuts out the workpiece. Has anybody ever seen a CNC router before? It's pretty killer, yeah? Choice, huh? Yeah, so CNC is the acronym for computer numerically controlled. And if you could imagine, the table of the of the tool is eight feet long by four feet long or wide, excuse me. And the travel of the of the router head is nine inches. So if we broke that table down into thousands of an inch, running on the y axis, thousands of an inch, running on the x axis, and thousands of an inch running on the z axis. Every time a line touches itself, that's coordinates. And we're basically telling the machine, we want you to cut from this point to this point, from this point to this point. 
It's extremely accurate. It's a whole new level of accuracy that was totally unattainable to the ukulele industry 10 years ago. So the CNC shaped neck will ultimately become final sanded before it gets joined with the body. Next we're going to prepare our fingerboards and the fingerboards are very important and I have a few examples here. You'll see a rough, what we consider rough, fingerboard blank, no inlays, just the fret slots. Then you'll see one that we've actually done the inlays, that's New Zealand abalone, five millimeter position markers. And then you'll see a finished fingerboard which actually has its frets. I'm going to pass it around. Now the CNC machine also creates the fingerboards. It's very, very accurate extremely accurate so it's introducing a whole new level of accuracy to our shop we'll cut them on the CNC we'll go ahead and do the inlays on the instrument and those are position markers those are to help the player to find his landmarks or her landmarks on the instrument and they're placed at the third fifth seventh tenth twelfth where we put two and that's where the scale is actually going to repeat itself and we'll put one more at the fifteenth position and that's all to help with the playing of the instrument. <clears throat> then we'll go ahead and install the fret wire. The fret wire is very important because it's going to help to determine each tone and semitone or each note on a pentatonic scale. In this case, which is basically 12 notes. That's what the ukulele is built off of. There's actually two and a half octaves of 12 notes that are happening on there. So we're able to determine each of those notes using an 18% nickel fret wire. Now in our shop we have what is called quality control checkpoints and pretty much any time a workpiece exchanges hands from one person to another it goes through what we call QC. They're checking for the quality of the workpiece that's being passed. They're looking for many many different checkpoints along the way to make sure that the instrument is cared for, handled and being built properly. Upon completion, upon completion of assembly before going on to a, a finishing we're going to definitely inspect the whole instrument. And Pete is actually installing a fingerboard, getting ready to do what we call final QC before we deliver it to our finishing department. <clears throat> Next, we're going to start the preparation of the instrument to receive its finish. Now, although the ukulele looks complete, there's a point here, I'm going to back up a frame. You'll see where what Pete is working on, you know, it starts to really look like an ukulele. But in actuality, that's only the halfway point right here. We still have the finishing of the instrument. So once we bring the instrument upstairs, we're going to do the finishing portion of the ukulele. We convert it to a UV cured finish. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. The traditional way of finishing a musical instrument, an ukulele included, was with a nitrocellulose lacquer, which is basically the industry standard for how you finished a musical instrument. And what you would do to achieve a finish on a lacquer finish would be you would apply it to the instrument, let the instrument hang around, and it would cure through evaporation. So basically, the thinners would evaporate, leaving back the solids. Well, what we learned, the thinners that are evaporating are actually VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. Those are things that we learned they are not good for us, they're not good for our environment. So the finish that we do actually cures very differently. It cures through exposure to UV light. So in theory, we could apply finish to the ukulele, hang it outside, hope for a beautiful Hawaiian sunny day, and the finish would cure. But the downside is, well, as you guys know, in Kaneohe, it's not about if it rains, it's when it rains, you know, it's gonna rain. Or also the sun actually omits a wide spectrum of light. A lot of what the sun omits generates heat. Heat hinders the polymers and oglomers from bonding. It actually hinders the finish from curing. So because we have a humidity controlled environment in our shop, we have an air duct that's specific for our light box, which then keeps the ambient temperature in our light box very cool. And that allows the polymers and oglomers to bond more efficiently or allows the finish on the instrument to cure more efficiently. It's a really, really fascinating process. <clears throat> what we'll actually do is where the bridge is going to go, this is the bridge and it's holding the strings here. Where the bridge is going to go, we're going to 
tape that area off. We want to protect the raw wood where the bridge is sitting because we're going to install the bridge after the instrument is finished. So we actually want to protect the raw wood there. Once we are done and finished with the instrument, we're able to remove that mask. It's a very thin piece of mylar, which then exposes the raw wood and we'll be able to glue the bridge on to the instrument and that just ensures good wood to wood adhesion when we go to glue the bridge on. You can see here where we're actually applying finish. So this is uh, an ukulele that's having the finish sprayed on. We'll sand in between the coats of finish and progressively sand with finer sandpaper until we do the final spray where we'll do the final sanding where we start off with 600 grit, 800, 1000, 1200, 1500 grit, and then we'll actually buff the ukulele. And that's how we get to this high gloss finish is through buffing the finish on the instrument. Now, although the ukulele kind of looks like we got it and dunked the ukulele in plastic, the reality it's not. The finish is extremely thin and that's what we're looking for because we don't want to take away the sound of the instrument but we want to protect the instrument. And that's the whole reason why we put a finish on the ukulele in the first place. Now, as the ukulele goes into final setup, this is where we're going to install the bridge. So Kaleo is actually removing the mask that was around the bridge. And here's a picture of, of an ukulele that's having its bridge glued on. You can see the Honus inlay. That was done earlier at the Rosette station. Then in the final setup area, we're going to dress the frets. So if you see that fingerboard that's coming around with the fret still installed, if you run your finger along the edge of the fretboard, the frets are kind of sharp. It's not player friendly. We want to make it to where the side of the fingerboard or along the edge here is player friendly. So we have to dress the frets and that takes place in final setup. We'll also install the tuning keys and that's going to help to actually tune the instrument. It's an important part of the instrument. And then we'll do the final fitting for the nut which is up here where the strings ride, and also the saddle, which is down here on the bridge. <clears throat> and then we'll install the strings and then bring the instrument up to pitch before we do the final inspection. And during final inspection, we're actually playing. We want to check the notes. So we're actually playing each instrument, checking the clarity of the note, checking for the intonation, which is how true is the note, we're also checking the action, which is the height of the string over the fret. These are all things that are leading to the final playability of the instrument, which is really important. Now, a division under Kanileo Ukulele is Nani E Kolu. At Nani E Kolu, we have a reforestation project. And what we're doing is we're reforesting coal. Now, this is a goal that we have had for our from our existence, which is for every ukulele we build, we plant a koa tree. And that was a broad statement to make. Well, here we are. We've evolved as an ukulele builder. We also evolved as a company to now include Nani E Kolu, which is our reforestation project. So we're planting koa on the Big Island in Kealakekua, on the Mauka side of Kealakekua, which is south of Kona. And that's where Nani E Kolu is. So we're planting koa. We're reforesting native species. We're also, of course, helping the environment by removing the invasive species. So there are many invasive species that we learned about. Now, these are this is a whole side to ukulele that was really kind of unknown to us. I'll be very honest with you. In the past, we would buy koa, and koa would magically show up at our shop, and we had no idea on how much work it takes to get a piece of koa wood to Kaneohe to make an ukulele. Now, with Nani Ekolu, we've learned that. And it gives us a whole greater appreciation for what's taking place there on the Big Island. And with the reforestation project, we're able to really do our part. Because, quite honestly, the koa that we're planting today, we'll never build an ukulele from. Our sons will never build an ukulele from them. Chances are it's going to be our grandsons or our great-grandsons, great-granddaughters, who are going to actually build anything from the wood that we're planting today. So we have our little workshops and things like that. Of course, an ecological program where we can actually plant our koa tree. Now, 
Islander ukulele, which I see over here, you guys have. Islander is a division under Kanileo ukulele. Islander is actually our affordable line. So we offer both our Hawaiian made in Kaneohe ukulele, which is Kanilea, and we also offer our overseas made affordable line, which is Islander by Kanilea. So this is just a quick ex explanation about them. Great sound, great playability, great looks. Of course, they're competitively priced and they use the same quality way of how we build our ukulele. Bridge pin method of fastening the strings, a geared tuner, everything that you would find on a Kanilea, you'll find on our Islander at a more affordable price. <clears throat> Which then, of course, is a segue into our question and answer segment. So I know that the wood and the different components are being passed around, and I'll open up the floor to questions and answers. Anybody have a question? Please, go ahead. Um, everything, is everything sanded by hand? Great question. Not necessarily by hand. For the milling department, we have what is called a thickness sander, and it's basically a big drum sander where we're able to sand the work pieces to 80 thousandths of an inch. That's kind of the beginning or the rough sanding really in our shop where they're sanded to about 150 grit. There is a lot of hand sanding in between leading up to the finishing department. In the finishing department, once we have finish on the instrument, we use what is called a random orbit sander. It's basically a five inch disc sander that orbits randomly so we don't get any scratches or what is called pigtails. So there's there's both hand and mechanical sanding. Great question. Any other questions? Please. What what um what inspired you to start building Great question. Um you know I was very inquisitive. Oh the question was I'm sorry Moe thank you. Question his question was uh what inspired me to build ukulele and quite honestly it was I was very inquisitive I was uh, unique I guess you could say where I always wondered how things worked how does it make a sound what makes an ukulele make a sound basically that was my question you know I was the kid on Christmas morning who got I'm gonna kind of show my age a little bit but got a, a Walkman for Christmas you know played cassette tapes and you know I was had my headphone on and lo and behold by you know Christmas evening I was taking it apart to try and see how it works and of course that drove my dad nuts what are you doing are you crazy or what but you know I was able to kind of put it back together and actually get it functioning again it's just kind of in me I guess so that the inspiration truly was you know my aunt who was my mom's twin sister who planted a seed you know for a love for this instrument and that's pretty much where it started Go ahead, you had a question? Um, it sounds like you spend a lot of time learning and going into the science behind it, like as far as you know, the mathematical calculations of the curves and the seminar and all that. Did you go to school? Do you have to read some? Because you know, I mean, a lot of that, that's some pretty complicated when you have to access and stuff like that. Right. But, uh, did, you, did it take you a long time to learn that type of stuff, or did you have to hire somebody in to kind of teach you that stuff? Or what? What, what helped you get along to the actual hard science of it from just like being a there in your garage to actually the CNC machine? Great question. Uh, his question is, um, you know, what kind of schooling or what kind of background I had me basically to lead to this, you know, science side of the building of an ukulele. And, you know, obviously it, it, there's a passion, a, a love for the instrument, and that's what drives us. But in that... Um, if you asked me, I needed to know Corel and Corel X6 10 years ago, I'd say, you know, what for? You know, or I'd be running around the shop with a little memory stick. I'd say, oh, is that like our Word documents or Excel spreadsheets? You know, there, there, there isn't really training for a luthier. You know, either you, you know, motivate yourself or you inspire yourself to learn or you get to a point where you do require some professional help which we have had. We've hired an engineer who actually used to work for NASA. He was a, you know, a rocket scientist, basically. And when NASA cut back, he became a freelance engineer. And he helped us with the CNC programming, building the fixtures. So it's kind of a yes and yes answer. You know, it's yes to both ways how your questions were worded to say. I know there's somebody else had raised their hand. 
Brother in the blue, you had raised your hand, or in the green, you had raised your hand. Uh, well, my question was like, what is the accurate length from the string to the fretboard? Good question. Yeah, that's uh, his question is what is the what is the accurate length between the string and the fretboard or the top of the fret? That's that's called the action. Uh, for that, it's typically measured in millimeters, not thousands of an inch. But I'll, I'll translate it to say to thousands of an inch. So at the 12th fret, which is pretty much right in the middle, you know, between this point, point A and point B here, right in the middle is right at the 12th fret. And at the 12th fret, we'll take our measurement. And what our target measurement is 73 thousandths of an inch to 78 thousandths. So 75 would be perfect. The translation in millimeters is 2.5 to 2.75 millimeters. And that's what we're looking for there at the 12th fret. Now, we can lower the action, but if you lower the action too low, you risk the chance of the instrument buzzing, where you don't have a clear note. If you raise it too high, then it, it makes it hard to play. And then as you work your way down the fingerboard, the intonation doesn't, isn't as accurate. So it's a matter of kind of pinning down exactly where the action needs to be to allow for, to provide the, the best playability. Great question. And I hope I was able to answer your question. Yeah? Cool. Any other questions? Please. What's the coolest ukulele you ever made or ever played Ooh, great question. The coolest ukulele we ever made. Uh, her question is the coolest instrument we've ever made. Um, we made an instrument that went to a gentleman in Thailand. It had an inlay of uh, a clownfish on the headstock uh, swimming in an anemone. And then on the fingerboard, which is this portion here, it had a whole oceanscape. So it had um, clownfishes swimming in uh, an anemone. Uh, of course, the, the floor of the ocean, and then different corals. And it had a masked angelfish. So it was like a combination of like really hard to find native Hawaiian reef fish that was like a totally cool instrument for the inlays. The body of the instrument, the back and the sides, was actually made out of a railroad tie that was from, um, from Asia, built from a species that has been now extinct. They actually cut all of these trees down. And it's a, it's a Delbergia, which is basically a rosewood. It's a true rosewood that they made these railroad ties hundreds of years ago. Now they're going back and they're actually grabbing these railroad ties and we were able to get a railroad tie. That's what we built the back and the sides of the instrument from. The front of the instrument was actually the San Mateo Bridge, which crossed the, the bay. Prior to making the current, what is now known as the Bay Bridge, the San Mateo Bridge was built of Sequoia Redwood. And we got pieces of the Sequoia Redwood when they broke down the old wooden bridge to replace it with the current metal bridge, we were able to acquire a piece of this Sequoia Redwood, and that was the top of the instrument. So it was just like crazy, unheard of, never ever put together kind of wood in combination with just some crazy, super unreal inlays. It was like a totally cool instrument that he had bought. It's pretty cool. Go ahead, John. Um, you know, the islanders are more affordable mm -hmm. line of the Kanile ukulele. Yes. And I assume you probably have top of the line ukulele. What, what's the price ranges from those types of things? You know, what, what fits you know, just a beginner and what fits the, you know, the expert and that type of thing? What are the different price ranges? You know, maybe some explanation of the different product lines that you offer. Great question. Thank you, Derek. So his question was, you know, the price ranges between the islander and then, of course, the price ranges in the Kanilea line. You know, the Islander being our affordable, kind of entry-level instrument, they actually are priced between about 100 to around $500. So there's even intermediately acknowledged instruments in our Islander, or even professional. We have professionals who use the mm -hmm. Islanders, too. Um, with those, you know, they'll find the same qualities that you would find on our Hawaiian-made ukulele. And really, the Islander line developed because of uh, several things. One, we couldn't meet the demand with our current production. So, you know, our dealers, our ukulele community, 
was basically screaming out for a kanilea, but we couldn't meet the demands. When we introduced Islander, we were able to absorb a lot of those demands because we can have these instruments readily available, our dealers can have them on stock, and they're actually really great sounding, great playing instruments. In fact, each Islander comes here to Kaneohe, comes to our warehouse, and we inspect the instrument. It goes through the same quality control checkpoints that our Kanilea goes through so that we know it's a great representative of who we are as Kanilea. So between about $100 to $500. The Kanilea, on the other hand, it starts off at about $600, top maybe $700 for the entry-level Kanilea, and they can run all the way up to $10,000 with the Nemo and the you know super-duper inlays. And it, it's not the only one that we've built. We've built more than just that particular one, although that one was super cool. Um, it's not uncommon to come through our shop and we see uh, Brazilian rosewood with an Adirondack spruce. Those are like, you know, holy grail kind of tone woods. Or walnut with uh, redwood. Um, you know, different combinations outside of koa, which are like addressing the sound in a different way than koa does. Usually it's a little mellower sound or a little bit more complex sound. So the price ranges really can go from, you know, $100 to $10,000, depending on which instrument. Go ahead, Derek. You probably have some, you know, famous musicians in Hawaii who play kanile ukuleles. Who are the, some of the people that you know, maybe mainstream that you endorse? You know, individuals that have come to your shop and you know bought ukuleles, that type of thing. Great question. Uh, Derek's question was, you know, who who plays a kanile? Uh, so to kind of shed some light on some of our Hawaiian music, you know, artists, uh, Kelly Boyd de Lima from Kapena, he plays a kanile. Uh, Troy Fernandez from the Ka'au Crater Boys, he plays a kanilea. Sean Na'awau, Sean's son, Kupu Na'awau. So Sean was part of, um, originally, the Mana'o Company, but then started his own solo career. Uh, Kenneth Makuakane, who is also a 13-time Nahoku Hanohano Award winner with his group, the Pandanis Club. He eventually uh, produced Naleo, Naleo Pilimehana, and he was you know, with them for many years. Um, Willie K plays a kanilea ukulele, although he was endorsed by another company because uh, he, he has a guitar kind of background too. So um, Oscar Schmidt, who makes guitars, also endorsed uh, Willie. Um, Aldrin Guerrero, I don't know if any of you have ever got a chance to go to a website. Uh, his name is Aldrin Guerrero. He runs a website by the name of Ukulele Underground. And he's basically teaching the world ukulele. He's a local boy who lives on Kauai who has hundreds of thousands of followers, who has millions of hits on his YouTube channel. I mean, it's like crazy how this little boy from Kauai who can just shred his ukulele is really teaching the world ukulele. On top of, he's an incredible player. Uh, you know, those are just kind of tidbits, uh, you know, scratch the surface. Uh, Les Harris, he played with uh, Kawai Loa. Um, I'm looking back at my wife, who else? And we have a, a Ben Vegas, who is another endorsed artist. Steven Inglis, Slack Key artist. Kimo Keo, uh, Kamuela Kimo Keo. He plays with a group, uh, originally Pili Oha, but then he started a group. Um, uh, Hi'ikua. Um, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. I, I, I'll be honest with you. We have a wonderful family of Kanilea artists. Basically, the world's best ukulele players who somehow found our instrument and found that the sound and the playability and what they're looking for in an instrument, we were able to meet. And they, you know, very humbly ask if they can be representatives of us as Kanilea. Please. Um, first of all, thanks for referencing the lock, man. Uh, yeah, I'm showing my age a little. still relate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm curious about the strings. Um, yes. It looks like nylon, there's a four stringer there. Mm -hmm. uh, are they usually nylon and there's, you've got an eight string one? Yes. Um, on you know, some of the cards today, they, the acoustic strings that are coming out, they're mm -hmm. more of a, the last ones I bought were like more of a, like a Gore-Tex sort of yeah. thing that, that you get easy on your, on your fingers or something. Mm -hmm. Is it mostly just uh, nylon type strings? Primarily for the ukulele. Uh, his question was what type of strings and, and what is the material? Um, Primarily nylon strings, although for our ukulele, excuse me, we use a string that's actually created in Italy. It's an Italian classical guitar string maker 
who designed these ukulele strings. They're called Aquila Corde. And uh, Mimo, who is the head chemist behind the Aquila Corde strings, he developed a string that's very unique. It's a blend between nylon and gut strings, which is what a traditional nylon string instrument was played with, a gut string. And he calls them Nile gut. Actually, his modern recipe to say, he calls super Nile gut. So it is a nylon based string because the nylon brings um, wearability, whereas a gut string doesn't, doesn't last that long. It doesn't take humidity changes very well, where the nylon mix in there helps to add life to the instrument. But it is about the sound. And quite honestly, Aquila Corde has the best sounding strings. I'll be honest with you, they're not the cheapest strings. And that's what some people kind of say, well, aren't they just cheap old ukulele strings? In actuality, they're not. There's a lot of science that he puts behind his strings that really help with the final tone of the instrument. And that's why we chose the Aquila Corde strings. Go ahead. So um, a lot of people know, like, Kamaka, mm -hmm. Sunny D. Martin, you know, a lot of those great names in ukulele. It must be a really, really humbling experience for you to be amongst those wonderful instrument makers and to actually have Connie Miller <coughs> out there and running right there with them. And I know that they have their secrets and how they make theirs, but you're up here and you share your manual of how you make your ukulele step by step. Why is that? Instead of keeping it a secret like how all those late great guys kept the Martin a secret or how Kamaka made theirs or Sunny D. <coughs> why, why would you share your, your passion and your love for your making of the ukulele so <coughs> That's a great question, D. And his question is, you know, why would we share what we do? And quite honestly, this is how I see it. Um, Kamaka. They built a great kamaka. In fact, in 2016, they're going to be celebrating 100 years of building ukulele. That is a milestone. Whether they was making cookies or sweet bread, I mean, to be making anything for 100 years, that's, that's incredible. Same thing with Martin. But, you know, I can remember when I was first learning and, you know, going with Uncle Pete, we go to kamaka, go pick up strings. And literally, when we go there, they would shut down the shop. We don't can see the top secret stuff, right? And it's kind of a sickening feeling. I'm not going not to lie. It's kind of like, well, you know, I mean, it's not nothing that we're going to kind of steal. But more so, by sharing this way, I see it as if we can teach and make our industry one click better as a whole, then we've done our part. So we've had, you know, Kelly from KC, uh, KC from Kelly Ukuleles in our shop. He, like, learned our finish. Oh, how you do your finish? Come spend time with our guys. I open the shop. Come, you know, sit with our lead guy. Spend time with him. He bring Manapua. He aloha us. He's very grateful. And at the end of the day, I ask him, so what, bro? You going to switch? You like do this kind of finish? Oh, no way, bro. The thing is too hard. I mean, the reality is it's not easy. Um, you know, but I, I see it as we, as ukulele builders, are very fortunate because we are very busy. We are all blessed to be busy. And to share is just a small part. You know what I'm saying? Uh, here's a good example. We're in Japan, breaking the Guinness Book of World Records on having, you know, 2,300 something something ukulele players all there being led by Konishiki in Konishiki's song. You know, they love Konishiki, you know, he's this, you know, sumo, sumotori demigod to them, right? And he's over there jamming, everybody's singing, and here comes Casey Kamaka, throwing elbow at me. Hey, Joe, where do you guys get your mahogany? And you know, I'm not afraid to share, absolutely, bro. We get him from North American Wood Products, the guy's name is Steve Allison. His mahogany is the stuff, I mean, that's the stuff. You know, I, I see it as that's, that's just a small part of who we are. You know, we have no reason to hide things. We have no reason to not share because, once again, if we can raise our industry that much and have it that much better for everyone, then we've done our part. Go ahead. So, um, also I see, like you said, mahogany, cherry wood, and all of those other idealistic woods that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it'll be made out of almost any wood, like a kiave wood. Ukulele. It could, it's you know, interesting. Uh, kiave is very dense, it's very hard. The only thing that we would have to worry about when working with like really, really hard, brittle woods is it, it might have a tendency to crack. When you're seasoning or we're drying it, we want to dry it really slowly. I mean, there are certain things. Same thing with rosewood. It's, it's a very dense hardwood, ebony. 
So like the fingerboard material, it, you have to season it properly. So it, basically, yes, you can. What the sound is going to be, some of it is uncharted. You don't really know until you really put on the strings. I mean, you can tap tune and you listen to the wood and you listen and you kind of feel the vibration off of the wood. There are certain things that you do to kind of guide you to help with the final sound of the instrument. But ultimately, um, here's a good example. Taylor guitar, uh, Bob Taylor, he built a guitar literally out of pallets. He got material from the back of the warehouse, pallets, broke them down, sliced it, edge glued it, built a guitar, and the thing sounded great. Just to show, you can build a great guitar. If you know how to build a guitar, you can build a great guitar out of anything. It doesn't only have to be, you know, certain woods. Of course, certain woods, you do get a prize sound. And I would be shooting myself in the foot to say koi is not a great sounding instrument. You know, I mean, that's a great sounding tone wood. But we can basically build them from mango. We've seen stuff from monkey pod. Um, you know, in the shop, we have some ohia. We're going to try tests with ohia. Uh, eucalyptus, robusta. We're gonna try. Gotta try. I see it. You gotta try the tone. He, listen to the sound. See how the final sound is. Be, um, you know, taking that risk to try and hear what you can get as far as the sound. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, you talked about your finish mm -hmm. on uh, your ukulele. Um, why do you spray it versus you know painting it or? or something, and what are the advantages of, of spraying it versus whatever other ways that they do do it? Great question. His question is, through the application of our finish, uh, why do we spray it instead of brushing it? And quite honestly, with the spray, we're able to control the thickness of our finish. With a brush, we're not able to control the thickness the same way. Uh, a brush would, would come out kind of uneven. You know how you have those brush strokes to say, plus the finish would be really, really thick. Because ultimately, we're looking at a really thin finish. So prior to starting our sanding and buffing, the final thickness of the finish is already at about 4 mils. Uh, and if anyone is familiar with finish, 4 mils is like thin. If we were building cabinets, if we were building jewelry boxes or furniture, quite honestly, 4 mils, that's thin, really thin. But that's what we're looking for in the final thickness which ultimately leads to the final tone of the instrument. So by applying, by spraying, we're able to really control it. The pattern is really small. It's about just a little over four inches wide at the pattern, and we're able to automize the finish really, really nicely so it lays out like super smooth. And it's actually like a very little amount of finish in comparison to if we were to brush it. That's the reason why we spray. Go ahead, Derek. You have a lot of knowledge about um, ukuleles, obviously. Are, is there any classes or something like that you offer? You know, maybe to the public. I remember someone talking about you know, something you did at Windward Mall. You yes. know, maybe if you want to elaborate on that, you know, a lot of people are going to be watching this. You know, maybe you can help pass on the knowledge mm -hmm. some of the things that you've learned throughout your experience. Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, Derek was wondering on, you know, how we kind of give back in different ways. Uh, as far as the building of an ukulele. We officially don't have a class, but if you're interested in joining our team, you're always welcome to come down, fill out an application, come through the interview process to see how passionate you are and how, you know, how committed you would be to joining our team. As far as playing the ukulele, we do offer playing ukulele classes. We offer a free lesson every first Tuesday of the month. It's at Windward Mall, right in the center stage. And um, we pass out all of the sheet music. It's a free lesson. We have different artists come out and teach the lesson. So different ukulele masters will come out and teach the lesson. And it's a free lesson. And pretty much what it takes to become an ukulele club of Hawaii member is just come. Bring your ukulele and come and play. I mean, pretty much that's all we require. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, you know, this is something that we had seen across the United States where there are ukulele clubs literally now across the world. I mean, there are ukulele clubs everywhere. And my wife and I got a chance to go to Santa Cruz where they have a really big ukulele club there. And we thought, why isn't there one in Hawaii? I mean, here we are in ukulele Mecca. Why isn't there an ukulele club where we can get together and play ukulele? 
So we started Ukulele Club of Hawaii, and we teamed up with Brother Sam, uh, Lena Girl, and with this kind of Sam and Lena being our ambassadors to the Ukulele Club, we were able to create our Ukulele Club of Hawaii, where now we meet at Windward Mall and we teach ukulele every month. So that's super cool. Yeah, come out and learn ukulele. Any other questions? Please, go ahead. Oh, absolutely, bro. Guaranteed. <laughs> Look and miss. Guaranteed. You said you had a NASA engineer, a freelance guy now. Yeah. In what capacity does he work on the ukulele? You know what? He doesn't necessarily work on building ukulele. He helped with designing the fixtures, doing the programming, kind of the nuts and bolts of making an ukulele. Besides being uh, a NASA engineer, and being very fluent in, in what is called G-code, how a, how a CNC machine works. He's also a, um, an, an engineering specialist. So how he looks at our processes, you know, how the fixtures work, how we can improve on just the fixtures and how we hold the work pieces. Because, you know, it's one part to make a three-dimensional part. Let me grab the neck again. You know, this is just one part. It's a three-dimensional neck. You know, we took it from a two-dimensional electronic state and created a three-dimensional neck. Now it's a matter of how are we going to cut this neck so we have fixtures that hold the piece, which then allow us to actually cut it. So it's not just the 3D drawing. It's how are we going to hold it. So those are all part of the kind of engineering side. So it's just he and I collaborating, basically, figuring out the tool paths, seeing what kind of successes we get, because quite honestly, he doesn't know how to build an ukulele. He, he, that, that, that wasn't his thing. He's, you know, he's a, a NASA engineer, you know, he creates rocket ships, you know, I mean, really, really cool stuff he was able to do. Um, but, you know, it's great working with him, and he's been, you know, in, in many ways, very, very helpful to get us to where we are today. You know, like in any business, when they make their first dollar, they frame it up. Uh-huh. You know? Is there the first ukulele that you still have and how you made it that maybe it made out of a milk carton or something back in the day? <laughs> and they had your walk and go on? Do you still have that, that very, very first ukulele that you, you have? You know what? I'll be I'm very honest. Uh, his question is if I still have the first ukulele. I, the first ukulele I ever built, believe it or not, I gave it to my brother. He has my first ukulele. Uh, if he still has it, I don't know. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Um, you know, somewhere along the line, I learned that each ukulele is very, very special. No doubt about it. And every single one, I get, hand, you know, I, I teach our guys and even for myself, you know, I handle it with white gloves because they are very special. But I also know that it'd be humanly impossible for me to play every ukulele that we build and keep every one. Because one, we wouldn't be able to make payroll pay the electric, pay the rent, you know, I mean, those are all the business side to what we do. So the reality is, you know, we've created now this demand from our dealers and from our customers, and our job is really to help to meet that demand. That's what it boils down to. And our guys, we, we express that, but quite honestly, they don't necessarily see the line of customers waiting at our door. So we try to tell them, Hey, our dealer, Hawaii Music Supply, they're not kidding. <laughs> they need ukulele. You know what I'm saying? So we, we, we try to teach them some things in our business or give them insight into our business that not necessarily they really know or they really even sense because they don't see that line or they don't, they don't have that same um, demand to say that we see. Any other questions? Go ahead. How long does it take for your typical Kanilea version um, process from built? like start cut to like finish and then compared <laughs> to like your really cool version? Great question. Uh, his, his question was um, how long does it take to build say a standard model? A standard model in our shop today takes anywhere between four to six weeks. So we could say about four weeks for the more standard models. When we start getting into the inlays and things like that, it can take up to six weeks. For that really, really super ritualistic ukulele, um, you know, that probably took somewhere in the 100, 110 hours. 
of building and that's not eight hours every day only working on that instrument so it can take sometimes months to build that instrument now understanding there is glue downtime you know we glue to a certain point and we have to let the glue dry and then we can touch the workpiece the next day so it's not like you know eight hours of every day we're working on just that ukulele because um, it's not realistic there is glue downtime any other questions? You used to be on fire mat, so you still do it on your off, your off time? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, although ukuleles have been very, very... Uh, the question was, you know, prior, used to be a firefighter. I actually retired from the fire department and is doing ukulele now full time. Uh, so, yes, was firefighting and then doing ukulele at my part time. So, uh, historically, you know, firefighters, we all have a part time, whether... We do electrical or we do plumbing or construction or drywall, tile, whatever it may be. For, for myself, my part-time was basically building ukulele, uh, which eventually led to doing ukulele full-time. Although firefighting is a great career, don't get me wrong, very honorable, very noble profession. Um, it's not an easy profession. You're away from your family one-third of your life. You commit to your community and you do things that most people wouldn't do or see or be part of in, that, in, in their whole lifetime. But at this point, you know, I got to where I could retire, build ukulele full time, and it's, it's actually a really good place to be. It's a lot safer profession, put it that way. Go ahead. Is there or will there ever be a kanile of guitar? Hey, good question. We have our GL6, our guitar lele which is a six string, six course ukulele tuned like a guitar, capoed at the fifth fret. So where you would be playing a G on the ukulele, or excuse me, on a guitar, you would be playing a C like an ukulele. So we have our guitar lele. There is actually a nylon string, 23 and a half inch scale baritone, six string tuned guitar ukulele by Kanilea. Uh, it's out there, yeah. Uh, so to say, is there a guitar in our future? Cannot promise. Right now, we're very busy with ukulele. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have the ability. We've had customers who say, why aren't you building guitars? Your ukulele is phenomenal. You could compete right up there with any of the guitar guys. But quite honestly, once again, we're, we've been very blessed with ukulele. And to be busy is a blessing. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, we're going. Oh, go go ahead. Sure. Um, you said the other guys were asking you how you did your finish. What did they do? Do their finish versus what you do? I know you do the spraying. And yeah, they typically. His question is, what what kind of other finish is out there in our industry? It's typically still a nitrocellulose lacquer. I mean, they haven't converted to the UV process. Uh, the nitrocellulose lacquer one is very easily available. I mean, we could go to City Mill and we can pick up a can of lacquer, you know, and you can apply it to your project, your ukulele, if you wanted to. Whereas the UV product, you actually have to bring in from South Carolina. We get our product from uh, Axon Hensel. Um, plus, to convert to UV is very expensive. Uh, the UV light box that we use, that's a $48,000 piece of machinery. The equipment that we use to apply the finish the gun is a $7,000 spray gun. The filters, the filtration system is a $3,500 filtration system. I mean, it takes a big commitment to go to UV. And I think that's where others have, have resisted. Plus, there isn't really any pressure, unlike um, in, in some other states where, uh, you know, the air quality and the, the restrictions that come with air quality is a lot stricter. Uh, in Hawaii, we have this beautiful trade winds, and they blow all the time, and all of the stuff just continues to kind of blow away. Whereas in California, they have a very, very strict air regulation through the, you know, through the EPA. So a lot of the guitar builders there, they're they're not able to use the old finish because of its VOC release. I'll take one more question from Brado. He was right here, and then we'll get jamming. Uh, yeah, uh, his question is, you know, how do we tune the instrument? Um, 
you know, the gizmos, which is, which is a clip-on tuner, has been really godsend, honestly. Uh, in the past, it was tuned by ear. You know, you would get into a relative tune, but to really get, you know, a 440A to make sure your pitch is spot on. So when everybody's playing, everybody's in tune, they make these little clip-on tuners. They're really, really accurate. Or, you know, on the smartphones, they got apps, and you can download an app, and bing, 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 you can tune your ukulele and, like, nickety split. Uh, you know, technology is really surrounding us. But most of the time, people are just using a little clip-on tuner, and you'll probably see them up here on the headstock. And that's where they'll tune their instrument. Cool. I uh, hope I answered everybody's question. I mean, if there's really a pressing question anybody else has, you want to raise your hand. If not, we're going to jam. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. We're going to test sound real quick. So play one that Auntie would teach me. Huh? <laughs> Wow. Okay, we got to go into the archives. That's right. Um, okay, so my aunt, she, besides being my fourth grade music teacher, she went on to start a program in the public schools, which is called the Kupuna Program. And the Kupuna Program basically brought elders from the community into the elementary school to teach children Hawaiiana. And her Kupuna Program eventually was adopted in... Um, in Enchanted Lake, which spread out to then Windward Side, Ko'olau Poko, which eventually became a whole state-run program, which is called the Kupuna Program, which basically was priceless. That's how I see it as. It, it, it brought uh, mana leo, you know, people who were fluent in Hawaiian language, where Hawaiian language was um, held back. Here were individuals who are coming to the classroom and teaching Hawaiian language, teaching Hawaiiana, kind of the beginning of what is now, you know, Punana Leo, our, our immersion schools. So, you know, to say that she made an effect on my life is just one tickle to the amount of life she actually really affected. And, um, you know, a song that she always sung, and this is a song that I'm going to share with you guys, is basically the island medley. And it's a musical journey as we go through each of the islands. And the song changes pace, and there's a kind of a tempo ride that she gives us as she kind of showcases each of the islands. So we're going to start off in the big island. We're going to move to Maui. We're going to go to Oahu, come here. We're going to go to Kauai. And she always closed off with Molokai because our family roots actually go back to Molokai. So that's why she always kind of finished with Molokai. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll stay in the center. Sorry. Oops. I, mean, I didn't see the star on the ground over here. This is where I'm supposed to stand. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'll share with you guys uh, the island medley. Hey! 
ale, ale, le ana i como ki hana. See Brother Darren in the shadows of the reaping bar. <laughs> David, Brother David, Brother David. <laughs> hey, promise, promise. First time we met, automatic, we get friendship already for life, bro. Yeah? Thank you, Bob. Uh, anyway, so that was actually a musical journey. I know it was in Hawaiian. You're probably wondering, what the heck is this guy singing? But it was actually a musical journey through our islands. And she would always close off with Moloka'i Nui Ahina. Uh, which is, um, you know, each of these songs were basically the songs of the island. Molokai nui ahina, aina ika vehi vehi, eho i no mo e pili. It's basically saying, you come, you see the beauty as a visitor, and you never want to leave. And that's pretty much Molokai. I mean, that sums up the island. Um, and she would share this song with everybody. And she would always kind of close off also with, um, this land is your land, this land is my land. She kind of paid homage to who we are. You know, and I, I've seen, um, you know, both sides. I'll be very honest with you. I have a brother who's very sovereign, uh, very much Hawaiian, and, you know, renounced his citizenship, no longer wanted to be part of the USA. But the reality is we are Hawaiian and we are American. That's the bottom line. And if we cannot understand that, then quite honestly, you will struggle forever. Because one philosophy is, everybody just go home. Only Hawaiians live here. That's not, it, 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 that wouldn't work. That cannot work, actually. It's a matter of Hawaiians coming to peace, understanding, and knowing that there is a future as a culture. And we keep our culture alive through music, through dance, through ukulele. Wherever you choose, you can keep your culture alive. So uh, with that, I'm going to share another melee. Actually, this is um, kind of a modern song. And it was originally done um, by a gentleman by the name of Del Beasley. And Del Beasley, besides being just an incredible artist, he's so funny. The guy is the kind, leave you in stitches, so funny. He's classic. Uh, he's part of a group called 3D, uh, which was uh, David Kahiapo, of course, Del Beasley, and uh, Dwight Kanai. And 3D, they did unbelievable Hawaiian music uh, and contemporary music. And a song that uh, Del had written, who actually was memorialized by his cousin, Israel Kamakaviva Ole, was a song that Del had written and had no idea that Brother Is wanted to sing this song. And basically, Dell tells the story as, oh, Israel told me, I like singing your song. And I'm going to tell him, no, of course not. Uh, of course, I would love to share the song. Anyway, so Israel got the song, made it his own, and really kind of uh, made, made Dell's song, uh, Dell's Mele, in this case, uh, very, very popular. And, you know, as we kind of close up the evening, of course, I want to thank you guys. Thank you guys for the opportunity to come and share with you and teach a little bit about ukulele, teach a little bit about who we are as Kani Le'a. And we, once again, are very proud of you guys. I'm not kidding. Keep up the good work. You guys are doing awesome. You are making the right steps to then now lead to a better life, a healthy life, 
and a contributing member to our society life and keep up the good work. So once again, give yourselves a round of applause. And I share that uh, with a song, actually, uh, it's gonna be in A minor. David, he got him. You seen that? All I have to do is just three, four chords, and he got him already. Anyway, the song was uh, sung by Israel Kamaka Viva Ole, when, and uh, the name of the song is entitled Maui, Hawaiian Superman.
baby. How was that? For shredding. That's one Islander, bro. Yeah, he's shredding on one Islander. So you can see how, you know, music like that would influence anyone growing up here. And Brother Is is just one of the many artists who has now become the ambassador, I would say, to the ukulele. You know, his rendition of Summer Over the Rainbow, oh my goodness, unbelievable. And to this day, you know, with, with, with respect to Is, it was only after he passed that he has played an effect in the way that it has been on a global level. Growing up here, Brother Is was bad. With, from Maka Sons to his solo career with Kano Ai and moving on to, you know, Hawaiian Superman and, you know, everything that he did with his music, unbelievable. And it was only once he had passed that the world learned about Israel Kamaka Viva Ole and how really talented he truly was, him and his ukulele. <clears throat> um, thank you guys again. Thank you for this opportunity. I know I heard the Hanaho. So that means gotta play one more, yeah? No can just leave. <laughs> but, you know, Maui was the Hanaho. I don't want any more songs. <laughs> nah, nah. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's this uh, library of songs, you know, that, that I think, um, you know, as an ukulele artist or as a player of ukulele, you know, it, it, it touches you. And, you know, another person that kind of influenced the ukulele you know, besides Kelly Boyd de Lima, who, I mean, to this day, the guy is an amazing ukulele player. Brother Troy Fernandez. I wasn't kidding. I mean, these guys, they were awesome. And to this day, I mean, we, we are very blessed to be able to see these individuals and see them, what they do with their ukulele. I mean, they are truly ukulele, you know, virtuosos. So, um, you know, an, a, another song that I can remember growing up you know, kind of being played a lot in the in the in the circle of friends was um, a song called Noho Pai Pai, and uh, Noho Pai Pai was, of course, you know, made popular uh, way back when with um, um, with uh, Gabby Pahinui and the Gabby Pahinui band. Uh, once again, kind of revived with uh, the Ka'au Crater Boys, and that rendition is kind of the rendition that kind of sticks in my head. Um, and I'll share a little bit about Hawaiian language, maybe, so you get an understanding. In this song, there's actually some rich kauna. Kauna is kind of like a hidden meaning. Basically, there's this meaning, which is a literal meaning in Hawaiian language, and then there's kauna, which is, there's this hidden meaning. And the name of the song is called Noho Pai Pai, and basically that, that translates to rocking chair. And uh, what this individual is saying, you know, his rocking chair, of course, is his favorite rocking chair. He appreciates his rocking chair. His rocking chair is always there for him. But uh, he comes home and somebody else is sitting in his rocking chair. But basically the kauna is, uh, it's not him with his wife, it's somebody else who is with his wife. Right, so uh, that's the kauna. But the reality is he's associating it with his I see my wife going like this. I'm so sorry. But that's the kauna is in uh, someone is sitting in his rocking chair. Or I, I likened it to kind of a modern day, which is somebody is test driving his sports car. <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a fun song. I didn't see. I'm 
appreciate you guys giving us the time. Of course, keep up the good work. Now you guys know a little bit more about ukulele. Give you guys a little different respect for the instrument and a bigger understanding of what the ukulele is. I can promise you, gang, the ukulele is changing the world. It is all over the world. Ukulele is huge right now. I mean, besides at home, besides in the United States, Canada, Korea, Japan, Indonesia, Europe, it's all over the world. It's basically changing the world. It's once again become the people's instrument. It is literally changing people's lives. So you can associate this little thing, this little mini guitar, with bringing a lot of happiness to many, many people. So thank you guys again. Thank you for this opportunity. We appreciate you guys. Mahalo to brother David, Derek. The whole team here at Habilitat, thank you guys. Aloha.